off that real ground in stuff. Um, in some cases, take the patient to the OR. When I was 17, I got my GED and started going to college. I ended up on the scene of an accident. There were two young boys in this truck that had hit a telephone pole head on, and they were both unconscious. I was in the truck, you know, checking their breathing, and all I knew was to have them not move. I had been in a first aid class, but I felt like I wanted to be able to do more for them than I was able to do at that time. The more I looked into it, the more I realized that that is where I needed to be, was in medicine and helping people. I moved here and I started going to Olympic College and taking some of the prerequisites for either nursing or something in the medical field. I knew that there was something in the medical field that I wanted to do, but I wasn't quite sure. You know, PA school or possibly nursing school or something like that. Another PA that I worked with in the emergency room, turns out he was a medics graduate. He says, hey, look up Medics Northwest. And he wrote it in a little yellow sticky note and handed it to me. I looked it up and it was just, it seemed like, wow, this is something I can get into, this is something I can do, because ultimately it would put me where I wanted to be. I don't have a flat, but it depends on the part of the body, but sometimes... This is tough. And so being able to graduate and have this experience and have this knowledge, I'm just going to be excited to be there in the first place. But from there, it's, it's worse than me. I know I gotta know all my stuff, because I don't know where I'm gonna end up. That's one of the great things about the profession is that we're so versatile that we can end up anywhere. And what I love about our class is that we're all feeling the same way. We wanna go where the need is the greatest. I knew going into this that I wanted to practice as a PA uh, and serve the underserved children in America. I feel like I was once an underserved child as well. I kind of know how they feel. Um, and I just want to let them know that anything is possible. Um, if you continue to believe in yourself and continue to uh, stay focused, that'll mean a lot to me, especially in this community. <laughs>
ready to be tapped into. And tap into it they did. Of the 28 members of Tacoma Class 1, 14 of them, half the class, brought military experience with them to the MedEx program. I was working in a Jiffy Lube and a Sears, kind of changing oil and working on appliances. I originally joined to be an air traffic controller, but they chose Corman for me. It turns out it was something that I really liked and something that I was actually quite good at. I was embedded with the Marine Corps and a Marine platoon, so I was the medical personnel for them. So I was not doing very well and I said, look, I needed to change my life around and do some new things. I want to help people. I want to do the right thing. And that was when I decided to join the military. I actually was very interested in being a medic and in fact told the recruiter that I wouldn't join unless I was able to be a medic. And so luckily that was available. I actually joined the military for several reasons. One. I have a huge family history of people serving in our military and two, being part of a family of immigrants that came here from uh, the Philippines. I wanted to give back in a way and it was time for me to leave my house at 18 and, and figure out who I was. I was 20 something years old acting like I was 16 and I, I needed discipline and I needed a job that, that I could stay with like a trade craft and so that's why I decided to join the Army. When I did, you know, to talk to the recruiter and you know, pick medicine, and right away I just realized that I loved it and realized that I was good at it. Once I became a medic, I got uh, stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas. First thing I did was train the MET teams, which are uh, military teams that will train Iraq or Afghanistan armies. And what I trained them was combat lifesaver courses, so just basic first aid bleeding control, starting IVs, CPR, you know, things to keep somebody alive in trauma. My first deployment um, it was in 2004, and uh, that was with 3rd LAR. LAR, we're a kind of economy of forces kind of unit, so uh, we ride in these eight-wheeled angled vehicles that are amphibious. Whatever it take a lot of units to do something, we can do it with a lot less people. What's up, y'all? This is uh, January 29th, Saturday. That deployment, we were in the assault of Fallujah. From there, we went on to Ramadi. By, uh, Ramadi, Fallujah area. Uh, we just got told that we're going to uh, be uh, a ref wide QRF. So the chances are is that we might be going to uh, Baghdad or something. So we were pretty much like a traveling carnival, and we went from pretty much all, all aspects of Al Ambar province in Iraq on the first time. Uh, yeah, so that's what we're doing. We're just we would do a raid in the area, and then as soon as the area was secure, me and a few of the other corpsmen, we would set up a little, a little shop and try to uh, see some of the patients that, you know, some of their ailments that they might have. We call it like try to win the hearts and minds of the people. By doing that, we would also bring blankets and soccer balls and school supplies to the children. I remember landing, and we're like, yeah, we're not going to see much. The Iraqi army, they're nothing. Like, we're not going to get hit. You know, this is nothing. And the second day, we just, we just got hit so hard. People are getting injured, traumatic injuries left and right. So you learn enough to be able to save a life in combat medic school, but you don't really refine those skills until you know you have enough training or you've actually seen it before. And I remember looking over this guy, and uh, he was bleeding out, losing his, he lost both his legs. And uh, my buddy, who was a medic, he came up to me, and he just looked at me and he said, "You start CPR. Let's wrap some tourniquets on this guy." you start CPR. And uh, after that, everything clicked for me. All my training, everything I knew, who I was as a person and how I was trained, it just switched a gear in my mind permanently. When I was in the Army, even though I was working with physician assistants, I never, it never occurred to me that I could ever be one. You know, I was a PFC and they were captains or majors in the Army, so they were pretty high ranking compared to me and I didn't have the education, so it just didn't occur. But of course the idea of becoming a PA would occur to Brenda as she began to explore her options outside of the military. When I got out, I decided to go back to school and I was actually trying to get into paramedic school. I wanted to be a paramedic firefighter. I applied twice, got rejected twice, and 
they told me that my combat medic time and time working as an ER tech in Olympia didn't count. Hinaro too ran into some initial roadblocks on the path to becoming a PA. He took orders to a naval hospital in Rota, Spain, intending to get back into school and to move on to the next step. But um, unfortunately, I got stuck in, a, in the ER where I just worked nonstop shifts. And then as soon as the shifts came up, I got actually augmented back out to Iraq on my third deployment. And that ended up taking about a year. Seemed like there was no time for college, no opportunity for change. I mean, I was making rank really well. I was making rank fast. And I mean, I was progressing in my military career, but I always wanted more. I wanted to get out of the Army. Like the others, John Pennington found himself caught between the proverbial rock and hard place. I looked at what I could do, my jobs. I could be an ambulance driver, you know, $12, $14 an hour. Maybe I could be an ER tech. And at one point I thought, I should just go into a different field. Maybe law enforcement or this or management or something. I said, why would I do that and waste this entire skill set that I had? But then things began to shift. It wasn't until I actually, I worked with a PA in Broda, and he was like, well, why don't you try PA? You know, and it's just, that's when I, that was the first time I got that little bug in my ear about that. So um, while working down at Group Health Urgent Care in Olympia, my coworkers, my physician assistants there told me, hey, why don't you apply for MedEx? MedEx Northwest, this is Eric. And I'm like, well, what's MedEx? There's somebody for admissions available. Give me one moment. I got out and ended up in nursing school. Thankful for nursing school, but I, I knew it wasn't for me. I knew where my heart was. Moving back up here when I got stationed in Fort Lewis for my last assignment, you know, one of the ladies that went to our church is a medics graduate, so she told me all about medics. This opportunity came up when I was six months pregnant with my second child, with the possibility of Tacoma site opening up. And I started looking into it and I said, you know, I've, I've only a couple classes away from the requirements and I was just finishing up my degree, so I finished it up and I applied. So I did get an interview. I was extremely nervous as everybody is during their interview. It was probably one of the best days I've had in a very, very long time. I left feeling energized and inspired and I felt like this is where I need to be because everybody that I met that represented the program was caring and understanding and it was amazing. It's not something that I'm used to, so I very much appreciated that and got a call the next day that I was accepted, not only to the program, but to Tacoma campus, which is exactly where I wanted to be and nothing could have worked out better. And so hearing more of the history of the PA, I'm like, this job was created for me and people like me military medics. And of course, John Pennington was right. U.S. military veterans have been at the core of MedEx Northwest since its very inception. And it's fair to say, at the very core of the PA profession itself. Like the newly created program developed at Duke University a few years earlier, Dr. Richard Smith and his colleagues at the University of Washington School of Medicine sought out medically trained and experienced Vietnam vets to fill the ranks of their first MedEx class. Men like Bob Woodruff, Army Special Forces. I was in Special Forces Medical Aid Training called 91 Bravo. I was shipped to Vietnam in 1967 helicoptered into a, what they call Special Forces Aid Men uh, site because there was a guy that uh, was killed in action who was the medic on the team, on the Special Forces Aid team, and I took his place. So I was the new guy. Or Mark Patterson, U.S. Navy. I was a Navy hospital corpsman for just a little over eight years and then went to Vietnam for a year. I was assigned to Naval Support Activity, Da Nang, and that was a, there were some infirmaries and then there was a hospital, and I was sent to the hospital. More like Stephen Turnipseed, United States Air Force. I joined the military in 1958, and 
I became a basic medical corpsman. I went to surgical technician school, x-ray technician school, and I went to special forces aid man school. And then 1st 82nd Airborne Division, had some action there, I went to Granada, and was then reassigned to 1st Special Forces Unit, which was actually stationed in Okinawa. I had a dispensary where I'd see the mountain yards, which were hill people out of Pleiku in a small uh, village called Bemituit. I trained medics there to work with the mountain yards, IVs and dress wounds and splint and good dudes. When I got there, they said, hey, we need OR people. We see you're an OR tech. We don't have enough people. And so I worked in the operating room. I did some work in the triage area, suturing people, bandaging people, and then we did a lot of that in the operating room, you know, once the surgery was done, or we helped do wound closures. Because there were multiple wounds, we would do that kind of thing. You know, you had to keep yourself busy when you worked, so there was always something to do. And then I would go out in patrols, and for some reason the other officers, especially the officers, when they went out, I always wanted the medic with them. <laughs> In the Special Forces Psychological uh, Counterinsurgency Program, we went into Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand. During the last few months that I was there in country, I worked at an evac hospital, but it was evac more for indigenous people than for, for Americans. So we would actually operate, particularly if it was extremity type wounds, we would take care of right there in the hospital. Probably the the most famous thing that happened while I was there was a Vietnamese soldier who came in with a mortar lodge in his chest and I was working in the OR at that time and the surgeon removed that mortar around from his chest. One guy I remember came in and he had a spot on his hand that he was really concerned with and um, upon examination I realized that he had like about 60 percent capacity of his lung and consolidation and liver was probably down to his belly button and there were lots of serious chronic problems and uh, you know I started to try to address that with him. He said I don't want to talk about that. That's not important. I want to know if you can't do something about this spot on my hand, I don't need you, you know. And he just put on his backpack probably a hundred pounds and just trekked off up the mountain. And I asked the physician, I said, well, why don't we try to do something? He says, there is nothing to be done here. He says, there are no facilities, there's no medicine, there's nothing we can do that's going to make that any better. So, you know, we treat spot on his hand. That was my mission. Well, lots of terrible stuff, horrific stuff. Bad stuff. It was, yeah, that was quite the experience. Every year, the armed forces discharge 6,000 medics and Navy Medical Corps. I came back from Okinawa. I landed in Oakland, and uh, they gave me a discharge. This year, with the reduced commitment to Vietnam, the number will be even higher. I really didn't know what to do or where to go or where I was going to go. Most of the discharged men turn to jobs in which their service skills are wasted. I found a job working as a hospital assistant, nursing assistant. 
cleaning bedpans in the hospital. You would leave the military with lots of training, and the biggest job you could get was as an orderly. Surgical techs, dental techs, pharmacy techs, all the training we had, and combat medics just didn't have any positions to go to. It was far below what I should be doing, but there was something to do. On the other hand, there is an acute shortage of doctors in many communities, especially outside the big cities. So a new program has been devised. During that time, I got connected with the program that was being started at the University of Washington by Dr. Smith, Richard Smith, who wanted to take some of his highly trained military medics and maybe expand on some of that knowledge and put us into civilian practice. To put the supply together with the demand for the benefit of the public in general. I'd never heard of anything like that before. I never even thought about anything like that before. Uh, back then, 69 and 70, that was a pretty new thing. And the more I thought about it, uh, the more I thought, I really want to take this as an opportunity. Pull out an application, got an interview, and here I am. <laughs> Mark Patterson looks something like a young doctor might look. And the rest, as they say, is the stuff of history. But Mark Patterson isn't a doctor. He probably never will be. But yet he spends most of his time helping to heal the sick and the injured in the small town of Tenasket, Washington. The history of the pioneering Medex Northwest program. Mark is one of 14 former military medics who are working with rural doctors in the state under the sponsorship of a unique organization. It's called Medex and it has headquarters in Seattle. And the history behind the creation and successful development of a new healthcare professional, the physician assistant. We are taking on a kind of paradoxical situation that we, we found, and that is that at a time when there are shortages across the board in the health manpower field, that there's also a supply of readily available, highly trained manpower that can be utilized. And this is the former military corpsman. This is what Medix is set up to do, this is what Medix is about taking this, this manpower pool and applying it where the greatest need is, in the case here in Washington state, in predominantly the rural areas of the state. My perception of the future of this program was guardedly suspicious. I knew that it would be big, but I didn't realize how big it would be or how far it would go. I wanted to prove to myself and to others that this could work. I was pretty, I don't know, skittish, nervous, uh, scared. Didn't know I was gonna make a living and didn't know what was gonna happen with the program and all those things weighed on the back of my mind. I really didn't wanna be on TV, but they sent this crew and they were there for, I think maybe three days. And that was probably the, the first time it really woke me up as to what was happening with the PA profession and that it seemed to be working and they were telling people about it. In the hospital, I do histories and physicals on the Mayo patients. I think they realized that the, the Special Forces Aidman was quite an elaborate school, okay? And uh, uh, some of the stuff that we went through in our training uh, and some of the things that were experienced and treated in Vietnam, I think that was probably, you know, what they were looking at. All those Special Forces guys were also trained on how to work within the community. The hearts and minds of the community was a real important part of their training. Dick Smith really saw that training as an asset, not just the medical training, but the training of how to work within a community. But it wasn't simply their medical training and experience that made these early pioneers so attractive to the creators of a new profession. There was something else, something that came from their shared experiences as comrades, soldiers, warriors. It's hard to explain the sensation or feeling that you have related to actually caring for someone who's been wounded and killed. What we witnessed as medics and corpsmen and, and uh, hospitalmen was being under stress, not just caring for wounded and injured people, which was traumatic, 
but always under stress that you self were going to get blown up. I mean, you didn't know where mortars were coming from. You didn't know who was going to be shooting at you, no matter if you were in a hospital, in a truck, you know, like an ambulance, or if you were running right towards where they were shooting at you. It did lend a quality of shared experience and knowledge. A quality of shared experience and knowledge held not only by the 12 members of Seattle Class 1, but by the 28 members of Tacoma Class 1 as well. Spanning nearly 50 years of service and commitment, it's what they hold in common. There's so much life experience in our class, whether you were a paramedic picking up people off the side of the road, or, or you were a military medic, or whether you were deployed. You don't even have to say it. You just look at the other. I look at Chris, I look at Jake, or I look at Jim, and, and I just know it. The history of this program, the history of the PA profession, there is no better fit. I think a lot of us have similar thoughts and similar minds. So it's easier for me to get along with my classmates because a lot of them have chewed some of the same dirt that I did. Being in the Army helped me to just go with the flow. <laughs> we were both in the sandbox. We both, you know, did whatever we did. We built ourselves a pretty good support structure where we are being successful. And that's our motto, 28 in, 28 out. And with somebody, I don't care who you are, where you come from, what you look like, if you're next to me, you're my classmate. You're my brother, you're my sister, and I'm gonna pull you through. In the 46 years and counting since the founding of MedEx Northwest, the numbers of military veterans accepted into each class have varied. But the commitment to medically trained and experienced military veterans and the recognition of their central importance both to the MedEx mission and to the PA profession itself has remained steadfast. In fact, with the successful launch of the University of Washington Tacoma site and the graduation of its first class, that commitment has never been stronger. With class one and our impact on this campus and on this city here in Tacoma, um, we've just started to scratch the surface. This first class has been very motivated and very dedicated in giving back to the community, to the PA profession, local, state, national. They have been heavily involved. We've all heard many stories of class one Seattle and what a pioneering group of individuals they were. Somehow we lucked out and got an equally terrific bunch of individuals for Tacoma Class 1. In two years we'll have 30 new houses here. We Being Class 1 they had to establish themselves on this campus, establish a program in this community. It's pretty unusual for a body of students to be that motivated and that cohesive um, towards multiple missions at the same time. There's no question in my mind that that's going to carry on for the majority of them throughout their careers. There's so much room for us to do more in this community other than just showing up and teaching students and, and churning out really good PAs. There's, there's a huge space for us here and we've been welcomed and supported and encouraged to really grow in all directions within the university, within the city. The sky's the limit as far as what we